Well, let's get into it. And we kind of categorize the different things we'll talk about. So there's themes to these sections. And the first theme is geroprotective drugs, molecules. These are rapamycin, metformin, NAD, resveratrol. And so we'll start with rapamycin. But before we do, do you just want to quickly remind people your definition of a geroprotective drug and kind of how you think about that? Yeah. So Giro protection really talks more broadly about mechanisms that target, um, you know, hallmarks of aging. So a Giro protective drug would be a drug or a molecule that you're taking, not because it necessarily provides benefit in one arena against one chronic disease or one symptom, but rather because you believe it is fundamentally altering the biology of aging. And as such, taking this drug moves things in your favor. And that should mean that you would live longer taking this drug. Um, and so that's a, that's a very high bar. Uh, there are lots of drugs that are really effective at doing things that wouldn't quite rise to the level of being sort of gyro protective. So with that said, let's start with rapamycin. Uh, obviously a molecule we get asked about an insane amount, seems like its popularity has gone up. What do you put rapamycin in? So I'm going to put rapamycin in the promising category. Um, and hopefully in a minute or two or three, <laughs> I'd like to convince people of why I think it's promising, um, but clearly not proven, right? So again, just we've covered rapamycin so much in other podcasts, and this, this podcast is in no way meant to displace or be a substitute for those things. So if you really want to go deep on this, you got to go back and see the content in the show notes. We will link to all the places where I've done this. Um, but at a high level, right, rapamycin is a substance that was discovered from a bacteria discovered on Easter Island in the, God, probably the mid 60s, 66, 67. Uh, bacteria, if I'm not mistaken, was Streptomyces hydroscopicus, uh, at the time a very novel organism that had never been discovered anywhere else. And it secreted this chemical that was named rapamycin to honor the uh, island where it was discovered, Rapa Nui. And um, this molecule was clearly found to be a very potent antifungal, and that made it a, a very logical choice for a bacteria to have evolved to produce it, right? A bacteria is obviously trying to fight uh, a, a fungi. And so, um, you know, by inhibiting uh, that through through this, this molecule, uh, you know, the first thought was, hey, this might be the next, uh, you know, cure for, uh, for, for athlete's foot. Um, through stories that are really interesting to me from a historical perspective, but I won't get into for the sake of time, ultimately that drug, which almost died a thousand deaths due to lack of interest, uh, finally uh, was championed through a guy named Seren Segal, who has since passed away. And, and Seren single-handedly basically figured out utility for this drug that ultimately put it uh, on the map as a drug that found its ultimate, ultimate clinical application in organ transplantation as an immune suppressant. So in 1999, the FDA approves this drug for organ transplantation, solid organ transplantation, and it spends the next decade in relative obscurity. I mean, this is literally when I was in my residency using this drug amongst a cocktail of others for patients who had received heart transplants, kidney transplants, and liver transplants, which were mainly what we were taking care of. Fast forward to 2009 and um, a very well done study is published as part of the interventions testing program that looks at the use of rapamycin in a very well documented strain of mice that are far more representative of what happens in biology than the typical strain of mice that are used in a clinical research setting. You know, the rest is history, basically. That study showed more convincingly than any other study in the ITP history that rapamycin extended life in male mice, in female mice, and most importantly, when initiated very late in life, a period of time in which no other drug had ever been able to extend life. Of course, this was replicated many, many times in the ITP and elsewhere. It was also replicated in other model 
systems, meaning it wasn't just replicated again in mammals. People went back and asked the question, how does this drug, rapamycin, which inhibits mTOR, um, how does it work in yeast, in fruit flies, in worms, which, by the way, constitute about a billion years of evolution? And it turns out that it always seems to work. Um, and so it's for all of those reasons that I say, wow, this is really promising, but why can I not say this is proven? And the reason I can't say it's proven is we don't yet have sufficient evidence in the organism of interest or the species of interest, which is us. And the reason for that is that while there have been some interesting studies done in human, and we'll point back to a podcast that I did with um, Lloyd Clickstein and Joan Manick, um, there are clearly short-term studies that demonstrate that the differential dosing pattern of rapamycin can actually produce immune augmentation and immune enhancement rather than immune suppression. That doesn't quite translate to the question that many of us want to know the answer to, which is, hey, if I take rapamycin intermittently, as demonstrated by these shorter human clinical trials, will that translate to not just better um, immune function, but a longer life? Um, and so absent really good biomarkers for some of these hallmarks of aging, I think we still have a ways to go before we could say the following. Rapamycin is geroprotective towards humans and taking rapamycin, according to protocol X, will add years to human life and presumably improve health span. Uh, that's, a, that's an enormous claim um, where I say, a lot of work still needs to be done. And some of that work I think needs to be done in other animal models, such as what Matt Caberlin is doing in the Dog Aging Project. Uh, and some of, that worm, some of that work actually is gonna need to be done in humans using biomarkers that have yet to be developed um, that will be substitutes for some of these more important cellular markers of aging. And so I think it's important too, because you've been open in other podcasts, mainly with Matt on how you take rapamycin. But even though you take it, and with all you said on why you think it is promising, that doesn't mean you necessarily think everyone should just go out and blindly take it. Not all of your patients are taking it as well, correct? Very few of my patients are taking it. I would say if, I don't think 10% of our patients are taking rapamycin. And um, the, the reason for that, quite simply, is, um, you know, unless a patient is willing to go down the rabbit hole with me on understanding this and and sort of you know understanding the risks and probabilities and the uncertainty uh, you know i just don't view this as something that is that is responsible and i've of course i know that there are many physicians out there who are giving out rapamycin like it's tic tacs and chiclets um and the truth of it is you know we're not seeing a lot of horrible things happening so clearly in the short run that's doesn't appear to be a problem um but I also think it's, uh, I think it's irresponsible to represent that we know that that's going to lengthen life. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I mean, that, that's sort of why I think there's a, a bit of a, a disconnect in my willingness to have been taking this drug um, for the past six years uh, and my, my hesitation in just sort of giving it to, to anybody who walks in the door. 